Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to present in this conference today. I'm Celia Lahr, a postdoctoral researcher at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, um, and uh, involved in the evaluation of the COVID Care at Home program, uh, which is led by Dr. Eggerwall. Um, so for a brief introduction, Women's College Hospital is an ambulatory academic center uh, right um, in downtown Toronto. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it also became a COVID-19 assessment center. And so right around uh, or in March of 2020, when uh, the pandemic was starting, a paper was published by Trish Greenhall um, about remote, uh, remote consultations um, for COVID-19. Um, and in true evidence into action, um, the uh, Women's College Hospital took this paper and very rapidly converted that into COVID Care at Home, uh, which is a remote monitoring program that allows um, those who have been uh, recently found that they um, have uh, tested positive for COVID-19, were able to stay safely in their own homes um, and receive uh, quite comprehensive care uh, outside of just that COVID-19 diagnosis, allowing them to be able to stay safely in their homes. Um, and so the program was launched in April of 2020, uh, so quite rapidly and very soon after this, um, this paper was published. Um, and uh, shortly after that, I became involved uh, in terms of actually planning how we would uh, evaluate uh, this program. So our evaluation objectives fo focused on implementation outcomes, service quality, and impact. And we followed the quadruple aim framework, looking at patient experience um, and, pro and provider experience, whose focus focused specifically on uh, safety, effectiveness, equity, and patient-centeredness. We also had a couple of domains that looked at, or a couple of um, methods that looked at cost, um, and then looked at that bigger population health and program sustainability. And across all of these pieces, we were looking at some of the process measures around actually um, adoption and feasibility of the program right from the beginning and as it continued throughout the pandemic. And our methods were more multi-method evaluation um, using data from a variety of, source, of sources. So we had quantitative data um, or administrative data from 616 patients. Uh, and this was every patient that was included um, or received care in the program during the first eight months. So that was April to December of 2020. We also connected uh, or collected patient experience data. Um, so in one source, we had a nurse practitioner that was involved in the program, follow up with a clinical visit two weeks after discharge, and also asked some questions around, uh, around the program itself. So we had almost 200 people that completed that um, follow-up question or those follow-up questions and a survey um, that was a much smaller uh, number that responded, but we were able to get quite uh, a lot of depth within that data. And in terms of patient experience, we had three surveys that were conducted um, are at three time points, uh, the same survey at three time points um, throughout those eight months, uh, as well as some interviews and focus groups that were conducted in a period that was a little bit quieter for the program, as well as some stakeholder interviews that were the people that were really involved in right from the beginning about getting this program going and off the ground uh, and what they saw for the bigger picture health system impact um, and for the future of the program. So in terms of patient demographics, we were 55% female. 35 years of age was the median, and this might seem a little bit young, um, but that would be because the older populations had a different program um, and a different way of providing risk support. Um, so this was um, a bit of a different demographic that was being supported through this mechanism. Uh, and one of the ways of providing comprehensive care um, was to be able to provide support to those that did not have a primary care provider. Um, so 28% said that they didn't have one, um, but during COVID there was uh, several or many more that didn't know if they could access their primary care provider or they were actually closed because of the pandemic. And in terms of adoption and feasibility, um, there were 3,412 visits in total that were conducted uh, throughout the program. Uh, um, and 149 that were with social workers or mental health uh, professionals that were able to provide that more comprehensive care. There's a median of five visits per patient uh, and three days from the time that they received their swab result to receiving their first uh, visit uh, as part of the program, their first call. Uh, um, and the median time that people stayed in the program was about seven days. 
Uh, and in terms of that adoption and feasibility, the providers that we spoke to really talked about that steep learning curve right from the beginning. So it was fairly new to them to be providing virtual care. There was a new EMR system that they were getting used to, and really a lot of time on figuring out what those roles and responsibilities were while needing to make really rapid decisions as everything was, uh, was changing. But they fully recognized the strong need for the program and completely understood why there would be some challenges, uh, especially trying to develop a program so rapidly during that, um, during that time. And that flexibility with the providers themselves, as well as the overall program, to be able to adapt to the changing needs of the patients and the, and the system. So for the patient experience piece, uh, looking at effectiveness um, of the small group that, of patients that responded to the questionnaire, uh, many highly recommended the program, agreed that they were better man able to manage uh, their health and medical needs for COVID-19, and that the program was useful for managing their care and treatment. And um, they also felt that they had enough time with the doctor. Um, and some of them talked about having enough time with the nurse or the social worker of that comprehensive care um, if it was needed. Uh, and in that larger sample, so about 200 um, patients that got the follow-up uh, post-discharge, they were asked about some of the most helpful pieces of the program. And it was really clear that that regular check-in, um, having somebody to speak to that reassurance, able to ask questions, really came through as key um, piece of, of care for this program. We had a lot fewer responses when asked about what was the least helpful, um, but there were some pieces around those communication challenges, conflicting information, poor coordination, uh, which are things that the group was, was working towards as it um, became more established. So in terms of patient safety, we don't have the data for um, the full group yet, um, but we did a more comprehensive analysis of the first 97 patients. And of those, there were four emergency department visits, two that were directed from the program to be able to go and two that were self-referred, uh, no hospitalizations and no mortality. And from an equity perspective, that a lot of patients and um, providers talked about the most valuable part of the program was actually that there were people that were able to connect you with a primary care provider um, as part of this program. Um, so really that comprehensive care that wasn't available all of the time, uh, but those that were able to seek that service found it extremely valuable. And some of the other ways of comprehensive care was around food delivery, connection to Red Cross, um, more information about the, the government resources that were available and some uh, pharmacy deliveries. With the full recognition that the data that we have collected is not necessarily comprehensive of what was actually happening. And there wasn't always a good way to keep track when that additional um, support was being provided to these patients. And from a patient-centeredness perspective, 12% um, reported feelings of isolation. And although some of them talked about the program being able to help with that, um, there was recognition that having one phone call was, was reassuring, but it didn't necessarily help with that, uh, that isolation, although some did find that it, uh, that it did help. 93% agreed that their, uh, their needs were being addressed. Um, and they did say that it eased that anxiety. So particularly immediately after they received that diagnosis, um, being part of the program relieved their anxiety. Um, and 79% felt that they were always or often involved in decisions that met their needs. So from the provider experience, uh, there was general agreement that the program was effective and met the needs of their patients. They did talk particularly at the beginning um, that it was a new experience for some of them uh, to be able to have this new program and to be able to support uh, patients that had very immigration statuses. So if they were a refugee or an undocumented immigrant, um, they weren't always familiar with how to provide appropriate care um, because that would typically have been another program that was involved. Um, however, they were able to bring in that additional program uh, to provide support um, so that those uh, patients could also receive uh, appropriate care. Not. Uh, and the other piece that came up a lot was around that clinical uncertainty, but using the primary care approach, they, the physicians um, and the team was much more used to that clinical uncertainty. Um, and as this quote says, um, that in specialty disciplines, they wouldn't always be as comfortable with that uncertainty. And that was a big asset for this program, but they were all uh, kind of learning together and okay with, with figuring things out. 
In terms of that cost um, piece of the quadruple aim, we had um, three people that said that it would have cost $300 per visit if they'd needed an in-person appointment, uh, nine at $35 and one uh, between $150 and $300 um, if they needed to go in person. And in terms of the time, there was quite a wide variety of how long it would they would have spent uh, for themselves as a patient, as well as for the care providers, how much time would have been needed. And looking at this from the population and program, population health and program sustainability perspective, the program was developed very rapidly. It was basically launched within a week um, from being an idea to seeing patients, and it allowed it to meet that health system need at a really crucial time. Not by allowing patients and providers to be able to remain at home. And the program was also able to pivot to meet the changing needs of that system and has with that flexibility means that they've also been thinking about being able to adapt this program um, to support other, uh, other patient populations or be working in, um, in other settings. So like this quote says that there's potential to be able to use this type of program in very low, low resourced uh, settings. And to focus a little bit more on the um, pivot uh, piece, we looked at um, in detail about what those pivot points were and we're actually able to label them in terms of, actually, of zooming in on a specific aspect of the program to be able to provide that most amount of benefit. When the system changed, the program was able to pivot to meet those needs. Um, so this paper actually lists um, some of those uh, documented pivots um, in the program and how they were able to meet uh, that health system and the patient needs. So just to wrap up, um, some strength and limitations. Uh, we had the, the data that was collected was used to help improve the program over time, which was great. So it's being fed back. Um, the leads of the program were involved um, quite extensively in the evaluation itself um, and was able to develop more of a, a learning health system approach where they had another system that was able to provide much more up-to-date uh, information to be able to inform their, their processes once the program was developed. We did have quite a few sources of, of information uh, to be able to contribute to that overall evaluation, but we had quite a low response rate from the patient survey. And within that post-discharge uh, data, it was part of a clinical visit that was conducted uh, by a nurse practitioner, which meant it was quite comprehensive what was there, uh, but it wasn't anonymous, and, uh, which isn't always the greatest for um, conducting that within, um, within the program. And we didn't really have enough emphasis on cost. Uh, so to wrap up, COVID Care at Home was, uh, was launched rapidly to meet the needs of patients who tested positive for COVID-19 in Toronto. And really using that comprehensive and multidisciplinary approach, uh, they were able to support the clinical and socioeconomic needs of their patients. Uh, so we had quite a big team that was uh, working on this. Um, so thank you to all of them. Uh, and thank you for your time. That's it for me.